God is with us, and let the people say, here we find new life. Good morning, church. I have to begin, as I so often do, by thanking Mark Mercier and Jim Martoccio for bringing the Holy Spirit into this place. Well, the Holy Spirit was already in this place, but boy, they, they propelled it out into the world through their uh, introductory music and the prelude. I have told Jim this before. I love it when he brings the tenor sax. I'm an old tenor sax man, and I have also told him this, that it's like I was playing an entirely different instrument the kazoo, in fact, I might just as well have been playing the kazoo given how the instrument sounded in my hands versus how it sounds in his hands. So um, it is um, both humbling and also a joy. Uh, So I know that all of you appreciate that music as well. Let me say, because I expect that in this season, uh, some might be tuning in for the first time, so I would like you to know that first Church of Christ in Simsbury is an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. Uh, If you want to find out more about what that means, you might google ucc.org, but let me just tell you, it means that we seek to be welcome and welcoming of everyone. Uh, We say, and never tire of saying, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Church. This is the fourth Sunday of Advent. We are in the home stretch. It is the Sunday we often refer to as Poinsettia Sunday for obvious reasons. You can see that the Poinsettias have arrived and are arrayed in our chancel so beautifully. Uh, Let me introduce you to the rest of the folks who are part of this service this morning. I am joined, as I almost always am, by my uh, dear colleague and partner in ministry, Rev. Kev, Reverend Kevin Weichel, uh, our children's ministry and uh, family ministry director, Jessica Wolanin, is both behind the scenes, but also you'll see her here reading scripture a little bit later. As always, we're joined by Annie Petiti, and I, I, I sometimes fail to mention it, but I shouldn't. Um, our facilities manager, Ardell McGee, is also here and plays such an important role in getting all this kind of opened up and set up and and making sure everything goes smoothly. He is joined this morning by his wife, Anna, which is a delight, so welcome, Anna. It's just great to be together in worship. Um, I tell you, you would not be surprised. We look out at a largely empty sanctuary, but it doesn't feel that way because I feel all of your presences as you engage and worship with us from your devices, from your homes, wherever you are. I would just say one more thing that it is easy in this season to dwell on the things that we are missing, the things that are absent because, of course, of COVID. Uh, I would encourage you to celebrate the things we have because there is so much good in this season. And though it will look different and feel different, uh, please embrace all the, the hope and the peace and the joy and the love of this season, and that's what we will try to communicate to all of you this morning. Oh, I, let, me, let me, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, this has not been advertised. It's a little bit uh, late in coming together, but following the Lessons and Carols service, which starts at nine o'clock on Christmas Eve, online, of course, um, I will be hosting, and I think Kevin uh, Weichel will be present as well, a um, a Zoom gathering, a little fellowship gathering at 10 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And uh, it's sort of in an open house format, meaning you can come and go. Um, If I can pull it together, I will light a fire in my fireplace and be sitting fireside, and I invite you to do the same. You can bring your favorite beverage, and we'll just take a moment to wish each other a Merry Christmas. So that will be on Christmas Eve at 10 o'clock. We'll get the Zoom link out to people. I believe we're sending an email out tomorrow with that, so uh, if you are not already on our email list, call the church office to make sure you receive that. Let us be together in prayer. In the rush of preparation for holiday celebration, we come to this place to be fed by God. We need the peace, hope, love, and joy that this season represents. 
we need to listen again with wonder at the magnificent words of Mary as she proclaims her faithful participation in God's most miraculous gift. Open our hearts this day, Lord, to receive the words and the blessings, to be fed and then to be those who will share with others as you have shared with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Because the world is broken and the wait is long, but love never ends, love faithfully goes about the work of casting our fear, speaking truth, healing the deepest wounds, crossing the divide from this world to the next and back again. Here I am, she whispers, the servant of the Lord. So we light one candle because it only takes one. with us. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let him be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. These are holy words. Thanks be to God.
I didn't have my mic on, and uh, because I had just begun, let me begin again. Thank you. I was distracted because we, we had a little candle thing behind me just before I started, and I was worried that, that there would be flames <laughs> rising up behind me, so um, let me settle myself and recenter myself, and we will begin again. Jewish feminist biblical scholar Amy Jill Levine admits, the Virgin Mary made me nervous. When I was a child growing up in a predominantly Roman Catholic town in Massachusetts, my friends informed me that Jesus would return the same way he had come before. That is, a Jewish virgin would be his mother. Being the only Jewish virgin in the neighborhood, I might therefore become the Messiah's mother. Consequently, during much of second grade, I was absolutely petrified that an angel would appear in my bedroom, say, hail Amy Jill, and tell me I was going to be pregnant. We call this story of the angel Gabriel announcing the incarnation to Mary, the Annunciation. And unless you are Amy Jill Levine, it is one of the most beloved stories associated with the birth of Jesus. 201, the women at Bible study last Wednesday were inspired by Mary's story. Kate King reminded us that the Orthodox Church refers to Mary as Theotokos, literally, God-bearer. What a rich metaphor for women, holding the ability, privilege, and responsibility to bear God into human life. And we reflected together, those Bible study women and I, on the idea of Mary mothering Jesus, teaching him the values of mercy and justice that she so clearly articulates in her song of praise. That said, the story of the Annunciation can also present challenges to contemporary readers, especially women. Setting aside the scientific credibility of the so-called virgin birth, for millennia, many in the church have claimed that Mary is an ideal model of submissiveness for women. It is not hard to see how some might interpret the story in this way. The angel Gabriel issues commands to Mary, using the word will 11 times in rapid succession. You will conceive in your womb. You will name him. He will be great. He will be called. God will give him. He will reign. There will be no end. The Holy Spirit will. The power of the Most High will. The child to be born will. He will be called. This is no invitation into a conversation. No, so Mary, what would you think about naming him Jesus? That's not how the angel Gabriel rolls. And how does Mary respond to God's commands? Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Given that God has often been understood as male, and Mary is a young woman, generations of theologians, priests and ministers, and so-called Christian men have used this story to assert that godly women should submit to men. Writing about the depiction of the Annunciation in Renaissance paintings, art historian Carol Strickland asks, should we consider Mary an ideal archetype and positive role model of womanhood? Or is her depiction an impediment to female empowerment? glorified only by accepting the subordinate role assigned to her. Activist and public theologian Christina Cleveland reflects on how early she came to accept her subordinate gender role with devastating consequences. She writes, when I was an adorably chubby sixth grader, our church youth group went on a summer trip to Disneyland. I couldn't have been more excited to go after a long and brutal year of being the new girl at my cliquish middle school, I was thrilled to explore the happiest place on earth with my old friends from church. But my excitement was tempered by one thing. 
Though I was unequivocally and objectively adorable, I didn't know that truth at all. In fact, I had received lots of messages both at school and at home that my extra pounds were unequivocally and objectively not adorable. So though I looked forward to the trip to Disneyland, I also couldn't help but negatively compare myself to the beautiful girls who populated my youth group. The only black girl in the group, I wished I had lighter skin, smaller curves, and straighter hair like the other girls. But more than anything, I dreamed that the youth group boys would swoon over me the way they swooned over the other girls. Unfortunately, my dream did not come true. In fact, my worst nightmare came true. At the Disneyland gift shop, one of the boys bought stuffed animals for each of the girls except me. Mortified, I ran into a shadowy corner of the park and cried, wondering why I wasn't lovable, beautiful, feminine, and worthy of a Disneyland souvenir. The words of my family members and schoolmates immediately came to mind, because you are too fat and unattractive. It didn't take much for me to add the line, and you always will be. My negative self-image seemed set in stone. Decades later, Cleveland still found herself being defined by men. She writes, my first book had recently been published by an evangelical Christian publishing house, and I had just endured a flurry of speaking engagements that exposed me for the first time in a personal way to the truly evil way that the evangelical world tokenizes, dehumanizes, and demonizes black women. From male hosts refusing to ride alone in the car with me because I'm a woman, to being repeatedly hit on by sleazy married white male pastors, to being pimped out on the conference stages in order to add color to the speaker lineup, to male speakers telling me that as a woman I shouldn't be allowed to share the stage with them. I was reeling with pain and had zero healthy coping skills. I numbed a lot of the pain with food, resentment, self-righteousness, and Netflix. But something in my soul kept gnawing at me, telling, that, telling me that my life was empty and perishing, yet I couldn't imagine another life, a different society, a liberating theological paradigm. Cleveland would finally discover that more liberating paradigm, not through more theological study, but by embarking upon a pilgrimage to 12 black Madonnas all over the globe, from the Caribbean to Latin America, to Asia, to Africa, and Europe. It turns out that black Madonnas are a thing, black depictions of Mary, many hundreds of years old, in paintings, statues, and shrines around the world. Many of these are pilgrimage destinations, and Cleveland committed to visit one each month of 2019. Here is the Black Madonna of Tournemire in Tournemire, France. Cleveland writes, I was eager to meet a Black Madonna with such strong, dark, and beautiful African features. A Black Madonna who looks more like Whoopi Goldberg than Halle Berry. A black Madonna who shows that being a large, strong black woman is just as beautiful as being a small, demure black woman. About this black Madonna, scholar Ella Rosett writes, this lady is a perfect example of the seat of wisdom or majesty type of Madonna. These are characterized by the mother seated on an ancient throne without a back, holding the child squarely on her lap and both looking straight ahead. You won't find demurely downcast eyes in these images, but a powerful straight stare. In the language of medieval symbolism, this means that Mary is the throne of Jesus, the seat of wisdom. From her lap spring wisdom and power. Cleveland concludes that Our Lady of Wisdom of Tornemere draws from her wisdom to tell us who we truly are and sets us free from our shackles so we can stand tall and firm like she. 
Over 12 months, Cleveland writes about her experience with each black Madonna and invites others to participate in her pilgrimage in four ways. Number one, to consider how cultural perceptions of race and gender impact our experience of the divine. Two, to engage a story or piece of art as we think about our own experience of the divine. Three, to reflect with others around our questions and experiences. And four, to practice a different way of interacting with the world in order to open us up to new experiences of the divine. Consider, engage, reflect, and practice. It sounds like someone else we just met, doesn't it? When Gabriel visited Mary, she was perplexed and pondered what he had said. That is, Mary considered. After pondering, Mary asked, how can this be since I am a virgin? This is no small thing to talk back or question an angel. Angels were fearsome and their visits often resulted in death. But Mary engaged Gabriel. She considered, then she engaged. Then Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. Together they reflected upon their miraculous experience of the divine growing in their wombs. She considered, engaged, then reflected in community. And then she practiced a different way of interacting with the world, claiming her power, singing her song of praise, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Finally, Mary sets out on a pilgrimage of her own to a manger in a town called Bethlehem. Poet Denise Levertov tells the story this way. We know the scene. The room variously furnished, almost always a lectern, a book, always the tall lily. Arrived on solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges, a guest. But we are told of meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. She was free to accept or to refuse. Choice integral to humanness. Aren't there enunciations of one sort or another in most lives? Some unwillingly undertake great destinies, enact them in sullen pride, uncomprehending. More often those moments when roads of light and storm open from darkness in a man or woman, are turned away. In dread, in a wave of weakness, in despair with relief, ordinary lives continue. God does not smite them, but the gates close, the pathway vanishes. She had been a child who played, ate, slept like any other child, but unlike others, wept only for pity laughed in joy, not triumph, compassion and intelligence fused in her, indivisible. Called to a destiny more momentous than any in all of time, she did not quail, only asked a simple, how can it be? And gravely, courteously took to heart the angel's reply, the astounding mystery she was offered, to bear in her womb infinite weight and lightness to carry in hidden, finite inwardness nine months of eternity, to contain in slender vase of being the sum of power, in narrow flesh the sum of light, then bring to birth, push into air a man-child needing, like any other, milk and love. But who was God? This was the moment no one speaks of, when she could still refuse, a breath unbreathed, spirit, suspended, waiting. She did not cry, I cannot, I am not worthy, nor I have not the strength. She did not submit with gritted teeth, raging, coerced. Bravest of all humans, consent illumined her. The room filled with its light, the lily glowed in it, in the iridescent wings. Consent, courage unparalleled, opened her utterly. 
So you see, Mary was not the least bit submissive. She considered, engaged, reflected, and practiced. Providing a model for encountering the, design, the divine for us all. Rather than submission, Mary models consent to courageous cooperation with the will of God. Consent to courageous cooperation with the will of God. This Christmas, we are each invited to do the same. We will not likely be called to a pilgrimage to Black Madonnas, though we could be. But God is sending a Gabriel to each of us, inviting us to embrace a liberating experience of Emmanuel, God with us, in which God sees each of us as he made us, as magnificent creations of the divine. May we find courage to consent because nothing is impossible with God. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer, a time to gather our joys, our celebrations, our concerns, and our sorrows, and lift them to our loving and listening God. For me personally, I'm glad it's not last week this time. Um, I uh, was not here. I was able to watch the Mary You're on Mute pageant from home, but I wasn't here um, because um, I learned that I had been in contact with someone um, who had been in contact with someone with, with COVID. And um, luckily, I, I got through the week um, and learned that some of the symptoms I, all the symptoms I uh, were feeling, I felt a couple, were from a flu shot. So that was a, a really, really uh, a good thing to learn. But it made me uh, really sympathize with those uh, who are in isolation as, um, you know, I had to be away from my family. And... Um, uh, not eat dinner with them and all of those things for a couple of days. And so, um, but thankfully, after some uh, negative tests, I'm, I'm back and I'm feeling good. We pray this morning uh, prayers of solace and peace uh, for um, Lois Lyle and the Lyle family um, following Bob's uh, interment, uh, the interment of, of Bob's ashes yesterday in the church memorial garden. Um, we pray for Jennifer Wilson and her family on the passing of her cousin, Brian Fletcher. 
for the family and friends of Judy Berry, who died from COVID-19. Judy was a dear friend of Andy Fabian. For the family of Jack Roloff, following Jack's passing, um, Jack was uncle to Cindy Bronlick. For the Dacoste family, the Dacoste family of Avon, for all of those who are supporting them through a very difficult time, the mother is battling cancer, and the father died of COVID last month, and the oldest child, Jenna, died of COVID last week. Jenna um, was a student of church member Anna Harris in the Avon Public Schools. So we pray for Anna and for all of this family's friends and family. For the family of Dennis George, who passed away suddenly last week, Dennis was the beloved uncle of Ryan Beach. And for the family and friends of Colby Vanderbeck, his mom Lauren, his father Ed, sister Helena and brother Henry. Colby died suddenly last week at the age of 28. He was a member of our 2006 confirmation class, a 2010 graduate of Cincinnati High School and a friend to many. May all of these families find comfort in God's presence in these hard days for them. May they be strengthened by our prayers. We pray healing this day for those who are sick or recovering from surgery. We pray for Don and Debbie Skinner, for the healing of Don's back and Debbie's hands, and that they may find comfort and relief from pain. We pray uh, for Susan Babcock White and for Bill White. We know they've been dealing with a lot. In addition to everything um, that Pastor George mentioned last week, um, Bill has been uh, battling a post-surgery infection as well since late October. Uh, he's scheduled to have his morphine pump removed completely on Christmas Eve, and he'll be staying in the hospital over Christmas. So let us keep Bill in our prayers. Amid COVID-19, we pray for the sick, the severely ill, for the dying. We pray for frontline and essential workers. As vaccines make their way across our country and world, we pray for declining infections and deaths. Now I will invite us into a time of silence, into a time of quiet prayer. Here, feel free to comment in the Facebook section there on the comment page. Um, any name that is on your heart, whatever might be on your mind, and together we will lift those prayers to God. And of course, God always hears and knows our silent prayers as well. Let us be together in the spirit and quiet of prayer. Loving God, we come to you, as always, with, with a mixture of joys and sorrows, celebrations and concerns. We praise you for welcoming our prayers. Gracious God, this morning we heard the story of Angel Gabriel's visit to Mary. As the story goes, Mary is at first perplexed. and She thinks Gabriel has the wrong person. How can this happen, she asks. As the story moves along, Lord, we notice a change in her perspective. As the angel Gabriel continues to explain the situation, she moves from confusion to acceptance and praise. She doesn't have the specifics. She doesn't know all that this will entail. She doesn't know the details, but she knows God has trusted her with much, and she is grateful and honored Loving God, like Mary, there is much we don't know about our country and our world, our lives, the lives of our children and family and friends. We only have ideas about what tomorrow might bring. As Mary experienced joy and pain through Jesus' life, we also experience times of celebration and sadness in our lives. And this morning, there are many hurting, families mourning, 
those spending Christmas in a hospital or in a shelter. And all of us are anticipating a Christmas without our usual traditions and sadness of not being able to worship in person here on Christmas Eve. And yet there is much to celebrate, love of family and friends, whether we see them in person or not, deepen relationships with neighbors, virtual connections with those we may not see otherwise. This morning, Lord, let us gather our joys and our concerns and take our cue from Mary. When we are confused, let us ask questions. When we don't know what the future holds, let us trust and move forward in faith. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. While Sarah and Laura Folsom, Folsom sisters, Sarah and Mary, did you know? Just beautiful, touching. So this Thursday is Christmas Eve. It's Christmas Eve. For so many people in this church who ask, what is the best part of Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. And we are pleased to say that even though we can't be together, our services will be online, live, live at their usual times. And during this time of COVID, we have noticed, I mean, there, there, we all know there are so many challenges, but sometimes there are blessings. And one of the blessings may be that 
Maybe typically you can't make it to one of these services. Maybe the time doesn't work because of a family gathering, or maybe um, you're far away, whatever the case may be. But you can tune in. You can tune in live. You can tune in later. And you can watch them again and again and again, if you would like. So the puppet pageant will be at 6 p.m. The puppet pageant is, it is just unique. You have to see it if you haven't seen it. Um, the story, the Christmas story, is told um, through a narrative on, and, and acted out on rod puppets that are handcrafted by church members. It's a tradition that's been going on at this church for decades. So you have to see it on our website at 6 p.m. 9 o'clock is our traditional lessons and carols service. Um, that service is scripture readings and songs by our choir and congregants throughout the service. Please tune into that. It's, it's, a, it's a very traditional and uplifting uh, service with wonderful music. Pastor George mentioned in the beginning of the service in his welcome that at 10 o'clock there will be a fellowship Zoom on Christmas Eve. Information about that will be in the email this week, so please look for it and join us. And then finally, um, at 11 o'clock, will be the late Holy Night service with a Holy Communion. Um, we have heard over the years many of you say, oh, it's too late, I can't make it. Well, now you can watch in bed. And... Um, I know having recorded this already and done this service early, I have joked that um, I may fall asleep during my own sermon uh, during, during, this, during this 11 o'clock service. But uh, please do tune in and watch our services uh, with us. At Christmas, God broke down the barriers and came into the world as one of us. In Jesus, God's hands touched all and touched us. Out of gratitude for that gift, let us give of our pledges and our offerings. You can find the contribution link in the comment section on the Facebook page or on our church website. Let me just say a couple brief things before I close us in prayer. If you can't tell, I'm a fan of the theologian I quoted so, so extensively, Christina Cleveland. She's a friend of the church in a way. Um, Sue and Larry Govain's daughter, members of the church, uh, was her college roommate, was Ms. Cleveland's college roommate, and they remain friends, and, and she has worshiped here in this sanctuary. And so um, I've referenced her in sermons before, but I want to lift her up again, not only as a, a good scholar and a woman of faith, but also as a friend of this church. Uh, first, and secondly, I understand that somebody texted in uh, suggesting that last week's children's pageant was Mary, you're on mute, and the theme of this Sunday's sermon was, George, you're on mute. So, uh, loved it, loved it. Thank you so much, whoever you were. Uh, uh, 
it is in that spirit of grace, in that spirit of forgiveness and laughter that I send you forth. May the spirit of the living God made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves, go beneath you to uphold and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion that you may know that you are never, ever alone and that you are loved love beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen.